Praise the Lord. Wasn't that beautiful? Yes, wonderful. Jesus is risen. And now when I say that, you have your part. Do you remember that? When I say Jesus is risen, you say Jesus is risen indeed. All right? We'll see how you do. Jesus is risen. Jesus is risen indeed. That's not bad, but you'll, you'll maybe get better at that. Uh, we, uh, Pastor Kyle, our former youth pastor, texted me this morning, and he said, Jesus is risen indeed. Amen. So glad you're here today. Uh, we are excited about what God is doing. <clears throat> you know, last night, how many of you are from Wisconsin? Anyone? Um, <clears throat> and I just want to say, I was, I was rooting for the Badgers, and they beat the undefeated Kentucky team. That was great, so congratulations. Uh, I will never root for the Packers, but anyway. Uh, <clears throat> but the Badgers, yes. But what amazed me was how excited they were about something really so insignificant compared to what Jesus has done. It's okay to get excited about Jesus, isn't it? And, and today that's what we're celebrating, the greatest significant event that has ever taken place in humanity. Jesus Christ went to the cross, he died for our sins, and on the third day he rose from the dead. The Christian church has been celebrating that victory for 2,000 years. <clears throat> and I believe we're getting close to the time where Jesus will come again. And when the way this world is going, friends, it could be in our lifetime. Uh, what is happening and to be ready for his return. So today we're going to be talking about the great events that uh, in the final days before Jesus died. I know that when... <clears throat> when we uh, talk about these words, they're more than just words, they're God's living words. So let's pray that God speaks to our hearts in a special way today through his word. Heavenly Father, I just want to pray that today you would speak to each individual here in a special way today and that you would help us to apply the things we learn to our daily lives in Jesus' precious name and for your glory. Amen. Well, again, today uh, we'll talk about some of his last words on earth. I know that when parents, how many parents do we have here? When parents leave a home, they usually, their final words are really important, right? Don't kill your sister. Uh, don't burn the house down. Right, all of those things. Final words. Where Jesus, when he left planet earth, he gave us some very very important words <clears throat> and I'm going to bring you back in time uh, to those words today he was with his disciples it was the last supper he would have with them and as he was sharing with them these important words we will go back because these words were not just for his disciples they're for every disciple they're for us today and so uh, chapter 13 of John before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. <clears throat> he had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I'm doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you will never ever wash my feet. Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Simon Peter exclaimed, then wash my hands and my head as well, Lord, not just my feet. Jesus replied, a person who has bathed all over does not need to wash except for the feet to be entirely clean. And you disciples are clean, <clears throat> but not all of you, for Jesus knew who would betray him. That is what he meant when he said, not all of you are clean. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, Do you understand 
what I was doing. You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth. Slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. I'm not saying these things to all of you. I know the ones they have chosen, but this fulfills the scripture that says, the one who eats my food has turned against me. I tell you this beforehand so that when it happens, you will believe that I am the Messiah. I tell you the truth. Anyone who welcomes my, my messenger is welcoming me, and anyone who welcomes me is welcoming the Father who sent me. <clears throat> goes on to say that then Judas, of course, went to betray Jesus. Jesus gave them some other words uh, after that. Uh, as soon as Judas left the room in verse 31, the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory, and God will be glorified because of him. And since God receives glory because of the Son, he will soon give glory to the Son. Dear children, I'll be with you only a little longer. And I told the, as I told the Jewish leaders, you will search for me, but you cannot come where I'm going. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have, lo I have loved you, sh should you love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Amazing picture <clears throat> of the last words, some of the last words before Jesus fulfilled his passion, went to the cross. And today as we look at these words, we have to really wonder what did he mean by all of this? What was he telling the disciples? <clears throat> Here he, as he talked to his disciples, he said, do you know why I've, I've done this? Can you imagine? Here he is, he's washing their feet. He's washing their feet. Dirty, stinky, smelly, fungus-filled feet. Right? That's what he's doing. He's washing feet. And he said, that's what I want you to do. Wash one another's feet. I can't imagine. And I don't know that if they were really comprehending this. Uh, this washing of feet. I, what I've done for you. My mother, <clears throat> uh, after I became a Christian in 1968, my mother two years later gave her heart to Jesus. And us kids were fighting one day. We're teenagers. We're, now all of us had become Christians. And we were, we were goofing off. And, <clears throat> and my sisters knew how to get to me. I have two older sisters. And they knew I just don't like feet. All right? Don't care for those feet. Especially my sister Joni's. She had her baby toenails. They were kind of ungodly looking. Okay? And, and so, I'll give you a picture of what they looked like. They looked like a parrot's beak, okay? That's what her toenails looked like on her baby toe. And any time she sat next to me, she'd kind of rub her toes on my leg. And she knew it just drove me nuts. Get your feet away from me. I'm going to break that little toe, that beak. <clears throat> anyway, my mother, this one day she said, Kids, Jesus doesn't want us to argue. He doesn't want us to fight like this. We've got to stop this. And she said, I read where Jesus washed his disciples' feet. And she went and got a basin. She said, we're going to wash each other's feet. I thought, dear God, not Joni. Don't do this to me. There we were, <clears throat> washing each other's feet. It was an amazing lesson that day. But what was the lesson Jesus was really teaching us? What was he teaching us? He was teaching us about servanthood. He was teaching us about humility. He stooped down to that level. Can you imagine the creator of the universe getting down and washing his disciples' feet? And what he was telling us is this. He said, do you understand what I've just done? Do you comprehend this? He said, I've just washed your feet. And the servant isn't greater than his master. And I want you to wash one another's feet. 
when I leave here, guys, I want you to carry this on. I want you to wash one another's feet. Well, what does that really mean? What does it mean in everyday life to wash somebody's feet? And as we look at that, and as I was praying about this message, God began to uh, speak to my heart. <clears throat> and uh, it's, it's, again, this act of humility. And I've always said, as your pastor, you can never, ever err on the side of humility. And so what is this washing feet? It's putting others first. It's putting my wife before myself and her needs before mine. It's putting my kids before me. It's putting my husband <clears throat> before me. It's, it's putting my neighbor before me. It's serving. It's, it's bowing down. It's forgiving that person that doesn't deserve forgiveness. That one that betrayed you or that one that spoke rudely of you in school. That's what it means. It's forgiving when, when that person continues to be mean. Washing one another's feet. I thought of those words and I thought, God, I'm not really good at that. I need to be better. I need to be better. I need to follow Christ's example in everyday life. I try to do that every day. But sometimes I get selfish. And I believe that if we put this principle into practice in daily life, that revolutionary things will transpire in our lives. And so it's, it's not self-acclaim. It's called dying to self. That's what this washing of the feet is. It's serving instead of being served. It starts at home. That's where Christianity begins, at home. I don't hear anyone say amen. That's where it begins. That's where it begins. It begins at home. It's serving your mother and father. It's honoring them. It's, it's loving your brother and sister. It's, it's helping your neighbor. It's all of these things. That's what God is talking about. True servanthood. True washing feet. Putting another person before myself, before my desires. But on Monday morning, so often we forget that when we go to work. Or <clears throat> when we have an employer that maybe doesn't treat us properly. All of these things. But God says, I want you to do this to be a servant. I want you to wash one another's feet. I think there's different ways that we can put this into practice. But I was a young Christian. I loved the verse from Colossians 3.23. It says, And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto man. And that means when I'm, when I'm doing something to serve someone else, even if that person uh, maybe doesn't appreciate it or whatever it might be, I do it as unto the Lord. <clears throat> I'm doing it for him. When you're washing your, your, your dishes for your mom and dad, uh, you do it unto the Lord. You don't say, do it yourself. If Jesus asked you to do the dishes, how would you respond? Well, I'd be happy to do that, right? That's what we do. We put that in, in that verse. Whatever we do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and unto, not unto man. Last night I was vacuuming. And uh, we're getting ready to go on vacation. And Karen's sister's coming to the house. And... And so, it's around 12 o'clock, <clears throat> and we're vacuuming, I'm vacuuming, Karen's doing some other things, packing. Uh, and then she said, make sure you get under that couch, would you? I didn't have a real good response. Um, I, I, I thought, I just, well, politely, I forgot about the verse, you know, and whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto man. And, and so I said, if you tell me to do something like that again, you can vacuum. It was bad. You know, it was just bad. And then she comes by. You're doing such a good job, honey. Okay, you know. Anyway, whatever you do. And so, at home, that's really where the rubber hits the road, isn't it? Do I treat my wife like I would treat Jesus? Do I treat my kids how I'd treat Jesus? Do I treat my parents how I would treat Jesus? Do I treat my neighbors? And we're going to see in, in, in these words of Jesus today how critical this is. Wash one another's feet. How can you put that into practice in your daily life? Wash one another's feet. <clears throat> Jesus elaborates on this in Matthew 25 and on the extreme consequences 
of not following his teachings. If you turn to, I think it's still too loud, Mike. It's echoing. I don't know what's wrong with this mic. But, uh, uh, yeah, maybe just keep it down a little bit. That'll help. Matthew 25, <clears throat> and let's start with verse 31. This, again, is right before Jesus is going to his passion. He's talking to his disciples. <clears throat> In verse 31, Jesus says this. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all of his angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. I want you to get a picture of this. It's really going to happen. Jesus is coming back. You know that little place they hate over there in the Middle East? It's called Israel. You know that the place where everyone's turning against them? That's what the Bible prophesies, by the way. We need to pray for Israel. Jesus, by the way, is coming back. And he's going to set up a kingdom, an everlasting kingdom, and it starts in Jerusalem when he comes back. Pretty cool. Why that little nation is always in the news? Read your Bible, you'll find out why. And so here, we need to pray for Israel. We need to pray for our own government. And, and so all of these things, Jesus is talking about setting up a throne. It says, all the nations will be gathered in his presence, and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep and the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand, and he'll place the goats on his left. All right? Sheep on the right, goats on the left. And then he's going to speak to them. He'll speak to those on his right hand. He'll say to those, Come you who are blessed by my Father into the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. Now when I hear those words, or when you hear those words someday, you will shout a lot louder than you did today in church. When Jesus said, Come into the kingdom I prepared for you from the foundation of the world. I'll tell you, I'll be doing cartwheels. All right? Our, our wonderful faith will be realized at that moment. Our faith in Jesus Christ. It's going to happen. And so, <clears throat> so he'll say, come, you have been blessed. Uh, and, and I'm giving you the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you... Hungry. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink, or a stranger and show you hospitality, or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren and sisters, you've done it unto me. Remember the verse, Colossians 3.23, And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto man. <clears throat> Friends, I want to tell you, when you do something as a Christian, and, and you're doing that, when you, when you go to that kid who's sitting all alone at that lunch table in your school, and you go and you sit by that kid and you say, Hi, I'm, I'm John, I just thought I'd sit by you today and, and you befriend that kid that no one else talks to. Or when you uh, talk to the employee that maybe no one talks to at work. Or maybe it's that neighbor uh, that, that down the block and you've never introduced yourself to them, but you go to them and help them. When you do these things, when you go to visit somebody in the hospital that is dying and you tell them about God's love, that is what you're doing unto Jesus. That's what you're doing for him. You're, He's, he cares. He loves people. When you help your parents at home, when you do that unto Jesus, these are all practical things for everyday Christianity. That's what God wants us to do. That's how he wants us to live. <clears throat> and he wants us to be mindful of that. He wants us to be so mindful. But then he turns to the ones on his left. The king turns to them and Jesus says, Away with you, cursed ones into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his demons. For I was hungry, and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, and you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked, and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison, and you didn't visit me. Then they will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? 
and he will answer, I tell you the truth. When you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you refuse to help me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. These are words from Jesus Christ. If you have your Bible, uh, you look at the red letter. Uh, uh, how many of you have red letter edition Bibles? I want you to know that that's, that's cool to see when Jesus actually spoke, but this whole book is inspired by God, right? The whole book. But this is Jesus speaking, and he speaks very clearly, <clears throat> very clearly. He speaks about putting Christianity in a practice. He speaks about washing our feet. He speaks to us about reaching out of our comfort zone, about maybe it's that person at church that you don't know, but you invite them to your home or you invite them out for coffee after church and you show them God's love. Maybe it's somebody at work. Maybe it's a neighbor that needs help. It, maybe, maybe it's a cousin that, that you haven't talked to, but you call them and, and you, you tell them, uh, hey, let's get together. I, I've missed you. And, and you start telling them about God's love and what God has done for you. When you do it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it on to me. Or when you haven't done it. You know, Christianity is so practical. But you have to look at it. It can't just be humanitarian. There are a lot of people who reach out to people. They do humanitarian deeds. They feed the poor. Uh, they send money uh, to help feed the poor. Uh, they maybe go down and they give food to chum. <clears throat> they do all these things. Maybe they visit uh, uh, somebody that's uh, a wounded vet. They do these things. But if you're not doing it in the name of Jesus, I want to tell you, Jesus said, many will come to me in that day and say, we've done all these good things in your name. And he'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ <clears throat> that compels you to do the things he wants you to do. I can't do it on my own, and if I do it on my own without God, it means nothing. Good works don't get you to heaven. Jesus does. But the good works follow. If you're a true Christian, these are things that are going to be active in your life. You're going to be doing these things. You're going to be washing other people's feet. It's something that God wants us to do. When's the last time you washed somebody else's feet? So very, very important. <clears throat> Jesus goes on to tell the disciples some practical things. He said, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Love one another. Love is a challenge sometimes, isn't it? Because Christians will let you down. Pastors will let you down. But when you keep your eyes on Jesus, I promise you he'll never let you down. I've been following Jesus for 47 years. He's never let me down once. Never once. Always there for me. Always comforted me through the Holy Spirit. I'll let you down. But keep your eyes on Jesus. <clears throat> He's the author and finisher of our faith. And when we're walking with Christ, it changes the way we live. If I lived at home, different than what I'm telling you, if, if I didn't put this stuff into practice, I could not be a preacher. There's days that maybe I don't or I make a slip. Anyone ever slip? Okay. But God gets me right back on track. Oh, I shouldn't have responded that way. Or I should have done that different. And so true Christianity <clears throat> is washing one another's feet. Uh, in First Peter, it says God has given to us uh, a gift. He's given us a gift. And it says we should use them to serve one another in love. He's given you a gift. He's given me a gift. He's given all of us a gift to serve one another in love. Are you using your gifts to serve? Are you using that? Uh, I read a, a few little stories. It was, and in Galatians 5.13, it says, serve one another in love. Uh, cute little story of a neighbor and, uh, and then a woman that, that was at work. This is called Snow Angel. I was working a second job as the night supervisor in a pharmacy when it started to snow really hard. I was dreading the prospect of digging out my car and navigating the snow-covered roads to get home. That was like last April, remember? <clears throat> but when I got out to the parking lot, I saw that somebody had cleaned all of the snow off my car. 
they scraped the windshield for me. And in a small bit of snow that they left on the hood, they had written in the snow, get home safely. Just a precious kind act. Isn't that neat? When we do these things unto the Lord, there's a reward. Last summer, when our lawnmower broke down, my husband had to use a weed trimmer to go out and cut grass. It was hot out, so he came in to take a break and get something to drink. When he went back outside, a beautiful used mower was sitting in our yard with a note that read, I had what you needed. Think about that. I had what you needed. God has given you a gift to use. What are you doing for his kingdom? How are you using your gifts? I had what you needed. I had a gift of teaching, so I taught your kids in children's church. I had a gift. I loved children, so I I went in your nursery and helped take care of the kids so the moms could get in here to church and the dads. I had a gift, pastor, of serving, so I served in the kitchen. No one ever saw me, but Jesus does. I had these gifts. I had something you needed. And I gave it to you. See, that's what the church is all about, isn't it? God wants us to use our gifts. It says, by this will all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Starts at home. It starts with the way you love your husband and wife. It starts with the way you love your kids and the way you love your parents and the way you honor them. This speaks louder than words. You can preach all you want about Jesus, but if you're not living it, people aren't going to want it. They're not going to want the product. And so, when we live it, when we practice it, when we wash one another's feet, we stoop to that place of humility. We ask forgiveness when we do something wrong. We call that person that maybe we've been mad at and we have a healed relationship. We do it because of Jesus. We'll never lose our reward. Yes, you can do humanitarian things. But Jesus talked about a different type of giving. Just like the woman at the well that he found, the woman that had been living and sleeping around, and she came to the well to draw water, and she was a Samaritan, and Jesus said, I'd like a cup of water. His disciples were in town getting some food. She said, why would you ask me for water? You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. We don't get along. And Jesus said, if you only knew who was asking you for water, you would have asked me, and I would have given you living water. I mean, just think, if, if you only knew, if you only knew that, that the God, the creator of the universe, is sitting right in front of you asking you for a drink of water. And that's what Jesus just told us. He said, when you do this in my name, When you give water, when you love one another, when you become a servant, you're doing it unto me. But he said, if you would have asked me, I would have given you living water. What does that mean? You might say, well, what on earth? And she said, man, if I could get some living water, I wouldn't have to come here and bring this water home every day. I hate this job. I want some of that water. Jesus said, go get your husband. I don't have a husband. He said, I know you've had five. And the one you're living with now isn't your husband. I perceive you're a prophet, she said. Isn't that interesting? She said, I hear that the Messiah will come at the end of their conversation. And Jesus said, the one talking to you, I am the Messiah. Her life was changed. She was never the same after that never the same her life began to change her sinful lifestyle she went out and told everybody the whole town ran out to see Jesus they said now we believe not because of your word but we've heard him for ourselves this Jesus is still alive and he still loves people he said The Son of Man is going to be lifted up. They didn't understand it. What do you mean lifted up? 
Then he says in John 3, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. When Moses, the, the snakes were coming and they were biting people and killing them, God was passing judgment on the rebellious Israelites. People were dying because of that poisonous venom. God said, make a brazen serpent and lift it up. Whoever looks to that serpent, when they're bit, they will not die. It was a spiritual type. It's called typology. It's a spiritual type. Just like when Jonah was in the belly of the well three days and three nights, it was a spiritual type that Jesus would be in the belly of the earth three days and three nights. This is a spiritual type of Jesus being lifted up on the cross, and whoever looks to him and puts their trust in him will never ever taste of eternal death we will have the hope of eternal life with Jesus Christ forever that's what Easter is all about that's why Jesus went to that cross for you and for me what a wonderful picture of who God is <clears throat> and he tells us to love one another to put this love into practice in every day life in everyday life there was a story a man was lost at sea. Just happened. Anyone read about it? A few of you. A young man in his fishing boat, sailboat, 35 footer, went out on the East Coast fishing, loved fishing, worked at a marina. His boat was called Angel. Pretty neat name for a boat. Went out to sea. It's gone for a week, then two weeks. Parents wondered what on earth happened to our son. It's gone for a month, and then two months. They begin to mourn their son. You know, there's nothing worse than losing a child, is there? Anyone ever lose a child? I lost mine at pennies once. Kind of a scary moment scary moment ready to lock down the whole mall looking all over where on earth did Thor go do you have Thor I don't have Thor where's Thor well he's just a little kid at the time three now he's six four I don't lose him so looking all over then I hear some giggling he's in the coat rack hiding that's not fun well this was a lot more serious than that a lot more serious. They had lost their son at sea. Parents, the mother asked God, just give me a sign. By Easter. Give me a sign by Easter. That my son's alive or not. Give me a sign. Family prayed. They were going to be getting together. They knew that the holiday would not be an exciting holiday without their loved one. And then I'm good Friday morning. They saw their son face to face. He had been lost at sea. His boat capsized. <clears throat> he got it upright. He was managed to bail water out. He broke his shoulder. Uh, he had just a small amount of food and water and there for two months he's without every time he's without water he said I started praying to God God I need water now I need you to bring some clouds over and he catched the rain water he said every time he asked God for water it rained <clears throat> he had a Bible on that boat interesting I guess if you name a boat an angel you should have a Bible on it and he said I read every word in that Bible he prayed and God answered his prayers and he answered his parents for prayers and he was found what a beautiful story and what a wonderful thing for that family on the East Coast but friends there's something a lot worse that man carried his Bible off that boat and showed the Navy officers that rescued him. 
told them all about it. I had this blanket protecting me from the sun, and I had my Bible. And I prayed, and God gave me rain. A lot worse than being lost at sea is being lost spiritually. That a son that's been in rebellion for many years, my son Thor, who I love dearly, lost. There's a lot of people lost, aren't there? Lost in addictions and sin. A lot of people lost at sea, but it's a sea of sinfulness. Prayed for my son many times. Many times. Karen and I have been on our hands and knees crying, praying. Not knowing if he's dead or alive. God is faithful. He's faithful. No matter what you're going through, I just want to know God is faithful. Five months ago, my son called me. He said, Dad, I've done some bad things, and I'm so sorry. I broke into your truck, and I took it. and did drugs. And I'm so sorry. I said, Dad, I'm going to change. Call me again. Dad, I've surrendered my life to Jesus. I said, Dad, I got down on my knees. I just cried out that God would change me. I didn't want to live this way. I didn't want to steal from you anymore. I didn't, I didn't want to do these things. And Dad, I'm done. If your parent has gone through that, probably say yeah yeah okay and you don't get your hopes up because you've been let down so many times because Satan comes to steal kill and destroy but Jesus comes to give us life and life more abundantly and that's what he has for you and for me Next month, my son will be celebrating five months of sobriety. I'm excited about that. Because Jesus came to rescue him and set him free. Just like he rescued my dad that I prayed for for 25 long years. My dad was an alcoholic and just stuck in his addictions. And probably worse than that, he was a stubborn Norwegian. <clears throat> sister got him a cup for Christmas it says you can tell a Norwegian but you can't tell him much it's so true with my dad but 10 years before he died he stopped drinking that was an answer to prayer he would have died probably within the next month skin and bones yellow from drinking liver shutting down but God answered our prayers I'm so glad he did I'm so glad he did so then he was just a dry drunk, stubborn, stingy, until three years before he died, he asked Jesus into his heart, and he was a brand new person, brand new person. That's why Jesus came to this earth. It says, Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. If you have a lost child, Jesus came to seek and save that lost child. If you have a lost parent, Jesus came to seek and save that lost parent. Jesus came to seek and save that neighbor next to you. And he says, I want to use you to do that. I want to use you. You go out. And that neighbor you've never introduced yourself to, invite him over. Show some hospitality. Give him a drink of water. Feed the poor, but do it in my name. And so they, today, dear friend, don't give up. Keep praying for your loved ones. Don't give up if you have prayers to God. He hears your prayer. But the most important thing today 
that God wants you to get on this Easter is that he died for you personally. He died on that cross for you. It's not about religion. We're not talking about being a Lutheran or Catholic or Presbyterian. We're talking about a relationship with the person of Jesus. Jesus Christ that will change the way you live. And he'll give you hope. You see, I tasted of that living water myself when I was 12 years old. I tasted of that living water. And I have never been thirsty since. I don't need a new car to feel good about myself. I've got a six-year-old camera. It's all right. I don't need the nicest house on the block to be fulfilled in life. I don't need a Rolex on my hand to feel good about myself. I've got Jesus. And Jesus is all I need. It's all I need. Aren't you glad he came for you? He came for you because he loves you and you don't need anything else. Maybe you've been looking everywhere else for the answers. But it's only with Jesus. He came for you. He came to seek and save that which is lost. I'd like you to bow your heads in prayer with me. And as you bow your heads in prayer, the God of this universe wants to touch your heart today. With your eyes closed, just, just think about Jesus and his love for you. He died for you. He died for you. Maybe you've been a Christian for a long time, but are you putting that Christianity into practice in your own home? Are you serving your wife? Are you washing their feet? Your neighbors at work? As Christians, we have to listen to the Lord's commands. And maybe you're not even sure if you're a true Christian. Maybe you've believed in God all your life, but you've never had this relationship that I'm talking about. Well, today God wants to have that relationship with you. Not religion, a relationship. He died on the cross for you, but he will never force his way into your heart. You have to open the door. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and I'm knocking. And maybe he's been knocking a long time at that door. But you've never listened to it. You've never opened that door. You've never humbled yourself to say, Jesus, come in. Maybe it's because you don't want to be accountable for your sin. We're all going to stand before him someday. If you ask Christ into your heart today, your sin will be covered. It'll be covered. The blood of Jesus will cleanse you from all sin and give you the hope of eternal life. What do you have to do? You have to be willing to turn from your sin and follow Christ. Get to know him. Follow his teachings and love him with all your heart. He'll come into your life. He said he'll come in if you invite him. If that's you today and you'd say, Pastor, I want to invite Jesus into my heart. I don't want it just to be religion. I want to invite him into my heart. Just slip your hand up with me, would you, if that's you. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? God bless you, sir. God bless you. Anybody else? Just give you a moment. God bless you, young man. God sees your hands, teenagers, grandpas, moms. God bless you, sir, in the back. Anybody else? You know, this is a very important day. You'll never forget this day when you give your heart to Jesus. Never forget it, I promise you. Jesus will never let you down. Never. Put your hands down. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And this prayer, if prayed from the sincerity of your heart, will change your life. It'll change the way you think. It says we all of a sudden will have a renewed mind. All of a sudden we'll have a, a brand new conviction in our life about sin. And if we sin, we have Jesus to intercede on our behalf. But he helps us to sin less. As I lead you in this prayer, you make it your personal prayer to Jesus. And if you're watching online today, you can pray with us too right at home. Follow me out loud. We'll pray with you as a church family. Those of you who raised your hands, we're not going to embarrass you. But we'd like to help you grow spiritually. Make this your prayer as we pray with you as a church family. Dear Heavenly Father. 
thank you for loving me. I know I've sinned many times, and I need a Savior. Jesus, please come into my heart. Forgive all of my sins. Be my Lord and Savior. Help me to wash others' feet and to follow your teachings. Thank you that I've been forgiven, that I'm a Christian. In Jesus' name, amen.